Hey, it's Dr. Asatar Bear, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the history of economics and the history of economics is very much bound up with the history of events, right? This is, this is how it works. You know, our ideas about things often follow the things themselves. We, we want to explain social and political and economic changes, and that gives rise to new theories and new ways of thinking, okay? So economics as a discipline is really born out of a great transition or transformation, okay? A, a, a transition from an old system, right? And what I mean by system, a social, political, and economic system uh, to a new one, okay? Old system to a new system. The, the new system is capitalism, right? So, you know, different historians and economists sometimes argue like, well, what are the key features of capitalism and sometimes people produce slightly different lists but you know basically what we're talking about here is industrialization and particularly the factory system okay of of manufacturing um, we are talking about the payment of workers uh in the form of wages okay so wage labor uh, becomes the way that Pretty much everyone in society, the vast majority, uh, makes a living. Okay, we have urbanization, where for the first time we have the percentage of the population that lives in cities rises and ends up becoming a majority in industrialized countries, uh, and we have a very dynamic uh, society. Uh, society changes. In terms of its rate of change, right, the the, the pace of change in many different areas uh, increases. We have economic growth, we have population growth, uh, and both of these are much faster than the growth that had occurred before. Uh, and we basically have a tremendous growth in terms of markets uh, and all of the activities that support that, such as finance, borrowing and lending, stocks and derivatives and so forth. All right, so this is the new system. And in this lecture, we're going to we're going to talk about that transition. Okay, so the old system, what, what do we come from? Well, this is feudalism. Okay, so this is a, a oh, let's talk about the timing here. Um, capitalism is about 300 years old or so. Okay, you could say that the roots of it perhaps go back maybe as far as 500 years, but you know, it, basically it takes a little while for it to get going. Okay, so 500 years ago, the old system, feudalism, is still very much uh, in force, right? That's that's what runs Europe and the world to some extent. Okay, so 300 years ago, capitalism is very young, right? 200 years ago, you know, we still it, it takes uh, hundreds of years to go through this transition from feudalism to capitalism. It doesn't happen overnight, okay? So feudalism itself is a much older system and had been around for a long time. Feudalism lasts from about the fall of the Roman Empire in about 500 AD to about 1500, 1700, right? This period where it begins to, to um, go through this transformation to capitalism, okay? So the system lasts a long time, right? It lasts perhaps 1,200, 1,500 years, right? Depending on how you uh, how you count it, okay? So uh, what is the, what are the features of this system, right? Well, in feudalism, you have a hierarchy in the society, okay? You have, you have the king, and then you have lords, uh, that are below the king, right? That, and below that, you have other levels. You know, there's all these different titles uh, within the nobility, right? So the the kings and lords and the, the lowest level of the nobility, the kind of entry level here, would be the knight, right? All right, and below that, you have the commoners, right? So some of these are 
are tied to the, their lords. Okay, so these are called serfs, or sometimes they're called uh, vassals. Uh, right. So the relationship between the lord and the serfs uh, is very important. This is kind of like the foundation of the feudal system. Okay, so the, uh, what I'm describing here are the different classes uh, that exist in Europe prior to the development of capitalism. Okay, so serfs are bound to the lords and bound to the land. I'm going to discuss that in a minute. Okay, now in terms of manufacturing, this is this has to serfs have to do with agriculture. Okay, so serfs are primarily take this is about farming. Okay, so now at the time we're talking about farming, agriculture is really the dominant sector of the economy. Okay, so there there are other forms of labor going on. There's other kinds of economic activity, but almost everyone in the economy is involved one way or another uh, in in agriculture. Right, agriculture is dominant. Okay, in terms of manufacturing, you have okay so. This line right here separates the nobility, right, that's up here, from the commoners, okay? All right, the commoners, non-nobles, all right? And there's a, there's a couple of different categories of, of non-nobles, okay? Some of them are serfs, they're tied to their lords, like I said. Some of them are, are, uh, are not, right? They're, they're like artisans, you know? They're... There are people who, who do crafts, right, who make things. You know, example, we could think of, you know, the, the blacksmith or the carpenter. The, you know, the, the person who, you know, they're not farming, right? They're, they're producing things, right? They, so they, they might be producing other things, right? This sector of the economy is manufacturing, okay? So... We are used to thinking about manufacturing as being industrialized, right? Because, you know, we're familiar with capitalism, right? So the original meaning of the term manufacturing, like its literal meaning is handmade, okay? So it's a very old word, right? Handmade, that's how things mostly were made, right? Before the Industrial Revolution. Um, so things were made by hand. Um, all right, so you, you, and the people who make these, these, um, Know, who are artisans and whatever, there's many different categories of them. They are organized into guilds, okay? We have the guild system, all right? So I'll, I'll talk more about this uh, in a bit, all right? So I'm just trying to, to sketch out for you what society was like uh, before the development of capitalism, okay? So let's talk about the serfs and the system of farming, okay? So the, the, the relationship between lords and serfs is very different than what we are familiar with today, like the relationship between the employer and the employee, all right? So he, here's how this works, okay? The, let, let's, uh, let's say that this is a, a piece of land, okay? This is the, this is the Lord's land, all right? Where there's like an overhead view, okay? The Lord's land. Um, so all of this land belongs to some Lord, right? And Europe is carved up into a patchwork of different territories, fiefdoms, right? Like there's this, there, this piece of land belongs to one lord, and right next door there's another piece of land that belongs to some other lord, right? Now, depending on their power and prominence and so forth, you know, they, they, have, they are either serving some other lord, right? This is, this is, has, there's many levels even within the nobility, right? Or some other lords are under them, right, serving them, okay? So... The Lord's land, and there'll be a part of this land, uh, which is called uh, the the Lord's domain. Okay, so this would be all right, and perhaps the the castle is like right here. You know, this is where the Lord lives, and right next to it is the Lord's domain. Okay, and maybe we have some some unused land over here. You know, you've got like a little little forest, right? Not all the land is being used. To farm, okay, so this land is is farmed, right? And then we have another uh, uh, arrangement, okay? Here's here's some other land that's also farmed, right? Here's the 
the strips of land that are that are farmed. Okay, so I'm just drawing a few of them, and there's a little house at the end of each one, and so forth. Right, so so these these little strips of land right here. This is called the serfs tenure. Okay, so this little strip of land right here is the tenure of that serfs family. Okay, so let me just expand on this a little bit. Okay, so what this means is that the serf has a traditional right to farm this land. Okay, the land does not belong to them, right? It all belongs to their lord. Okay, that is the basis. In fact, there's a legal thing that says only members of the aristocracy, only the nobility can actually own land. Uh, others cannot. They, there's, it's, it's literally against the law. Okay, so, but what they have is they have a kind of right to farm here. Okay, and this is passed down through the generations, right? If you're if your parents were serfs, you're a serf, right? That's the way it works. There's not a whole lot of social mobility or class mobility. This system, in fact, is designed to prevent mobility, right? It's, it's, it's all about knowing your place, right? And this is their serf's place, okay? So they have a traditional right to farm this land. It's their tenure. And, but it also carries with it an obligation, okay? Their obligation... And, you know, they, they swear an oath of loyalty and, you know, all of this is, is bound up with honor and all of this stuff, right? So their obligation is part of the time they must go and farm, grow crops on the Lord's domain, okay? So farm on the Lord's domain part of the time, okay? And that part of the time that they're growing crops on the Lord's domain, right, those crops are going to be kept by the Lord, right? The, the serf lives off of what they grow on their tenure. The Lord's income is based on the crops that are grown on the domain. So typically the domain will be the best, most fertile land that is under the Lord's control, right? Okay, so this, this system is, this is serfdom or vassalage or Sometimes it's known as the corvée, okay? This is also called corvée labor, okay, for the French term. All right, so the, the way this worked, right, the corvée labor system is, again, part of the time, let's say it works like this, right? Let's say it's three days of the week. The serf, uh, you know, grows crops on their tenure, okay? And remember... This forms the basis of the serfs, their whole family, right? It would be typically the whole family. It serves the basis of their standard of living, right? That, that is, the crops that they grow on their tenure, they are going to then eat, right? That's, that's how they survive, okay? But there's another three days of the week where the serf is going to go and grow crops elsewhere. And they're going to grow crops on, you guessed it, that's where the that on the domain, okay? So they're going to grow crops on the domain, right? And that goes to, like I said, their lord, okay? So this is the system of corvée labor. Now, obviously, this system is quite exploitative, okay? It couldn't possibly be clearer. I mean, after all, look, you are... You, you are working and getting to keep the fruits of your own labor only part of the week, right? Half your time or more is spent working for someone else for free, right? The serfs don't get paid. The wage labor happens much later, right? There's no wages here, okay? What happens is the serfs are allowed to work on a piece of land in exchange for that they promise to you know, obey the corvée, right? They, to, to go and work and produce on their Lord's land, okay? That is the economic basis of feudalism. And as a result, you can see, look, if a large group of people, because the serfs are, you know, the vast majority of the society, right? The, the nobility is a relatively small number of people, okay? Relatively few. So the vast majority are working to enrich 
a small number of nobles. Okay, that is the the unequal and unfair basis of this system, right? And it's very very difficult to change your, you know, it, it's all based on your blood, right? It's based on your birth. Okay, so you you are noble because you have noble blood. Ooh, special fancy blood, right? Mm -hmm. uh, turns out it's the same blood as everybody else, but I mean, it's the that's the idea, right? And commoners have common blood, you know. So it's a it's a system that's really based on it's meant to be very static, right? There's not a, there's not social mobility. The only slight possibility that you could end, that you could leave the realm of commoners and enter the realm of nobility is if you were knighted, right? If you're knighted, you know that's a kind of that's the exception in the feudal system. Okay, you, if you're knighted, you're now at the lowest level of the nobility, right? And being knighted gives you, usually it gives you a, a small portion of land and you might have a few serfs on it as well, right? So, you know, you, you because now you're noble, maybe you were common before, uh, but it's actually rare, right? Most, of, most knights were already nobles beforehand, you know? Um, because becoming a knight is, um, you know, it requires uh, quite an investment. You know, you have to learn how to fight and ride horses and you know it's expensive right so the the average person or the poor person isn't is going to be unlikely to be able to do this right a, a, a few did but it, it's it's you know again assist, the system is designed to be static it's not designed for mobility so the system is very very unequal right the, there's in a lot of countries there's only perhaps a few thousand people uh, who are in the aristocracy, right? In, in Russia, there's only thirty thousand families uh, that are that are you know out of uh, out of tens of millions of people. Uh, it, it's a very very unequal system, right? And it's extremely hierarchical. Okay. So, you know the and that extends to every part of society, right? So, for example, how are you treated by the law? Do you think the law has the idea that they're going to treat everyone the same, whether they're a lord or a commoner? No, not at all, right? Not at all. In fact, the, the lords basically make the law. What we consider law that's been codified initially only applies to lords, right? The, the, what applies to the commoners is well, whatever the hell the lord says, right? That's, that's, the, that's the system that they live under, right? L law at the time only... Uh, has to do with disputes between different lords, right? Um, so anyway, the point is, this system is highly, highly unequal, right? And of course, like I said, it is based on the exploitation of serfs. There, and that is crystal clear, right? I mean, it couldn't possibly be any clearer. You work for somebody else part of the time for free, okay? Now, of course, some accept this and some don't. Like I said, the system has lasted a long time in Europe, okay? So, and, and, and here's, just, just to draw the contrast with the new economic system, right? This is a very stable system, okay? It's, it's not a system that's based on change. It's based on things staying the same, right? So it's stable in the sense that, look, whatever your father did, right? Because this is a highly patriarchal system as well, right? Whatever your father did, that's odds are that's what you did. You are going to do right. If your father's a serf, you're going to be a serf, right? Father's a blacksmith, you're going to be a blacksmith, and so forth. Okay. Father's a lord. Oh, great, great. You won the one little jackpot there. You're going to be a lord. Okay. So, the very stable system, right? That it, it uh, what it, what the father is gets passed on to the son, and so forth. Okay. That's only possible when the society doesn't change all that much, right? Um, when the society goes through a lot of change, this kind of breaks down, okay? So let, let me just say, right, the, the, the rate of economic growth, okay, we have low rate of economic growth. Uh, so the, the rate of economic growth is estimated to be somewhere in the range of 0.1 uh, to perhaps 0.01% uh, per year. So this is a very low rate of economic growth. Okay, we're gonna we'll, we'll talk about how that changes uh, in a minute when we when we get to capitalism. Okay, 
what this means is that the society is basically fairly stable economically. It is pretty much the same economy that in the in the time of your grandparents as now, right? Price the prices have not changed. Okay, so the price level uh, is also very stable. Okay, so uh, again, these are things we're going to talk about later in the course, right? The the overall uh, cost of living. Okay, that's what we mean by the is what we mean by the price level. All right, we can contrast that to modern capitalism where the price level changes significantly uh, just in 10 or 20 years, sometimes even less than that, right? depending on how, uh, how fast inflation or how high inflation is. Okay, so we have low economic growth. We, we also have low population growth. Okay, So low economic growth, low population growth, these things lead to, again, very stable society. But it goes through... Uh, changes okay. okay so the system begins to uh, begins to experience tension and strain okay so tension rises in this system all right so the the feudal system is one that is heavily based on conflict right so the the uh, you know there's a lot of war for example okay so now these wars are competition they're they're conflicts between lords and their neighboring lords, right? Because every lord uh, would like to become a more powerful lord to, to have others below them, okay? So every lord, uh, you know, they want more power. Okay, so why do they, why do they want that? Well, one of the things that the, the lords do with all of these crops that are grown on their land is they have to pay tribute uh, to the lord or the king or the emperor or whatever, whatever their title is, right? Those that are above them receive tribute, okay? So lords pay tribute to the lord that is above them, right? How do you, how do you get to be above some other lord? Well, you conquer them. You, you you do it through conquest. If the other lord doesn't yield to you, well, you kill them. Say, hey, we got a new lord here. It's this person who's going to do what I want, right? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to you're going to get this. You, you're going to get the crops from the from the domain the serfs have farmed for, you, and then you're going to deliver to me a portion. Okay, that is tribute. Okay, so initially, the way this tribute works is it's a um, you know it's a payment of crops. Okay, so, so this is the, the, the corvée system and the system of tribute change over time as feudalism develops, right? No system is entirely static. They change and develop. It's just that feudalism does that relatively slowly, you know, uh, relative to the new system of capitalism, which is a lot more dynamic. Okay, so lords pay tribute to the lord above them. Initially, that tribute is in the form of crops, one of the things that changes, you know, as I'm saying about, you know, the, the level of tension, the strain on the society beginning about 500 years ago, uh, begins to rise, right? So part of this is the system of tribute and the system, the corvée system, goes through a transformation, okay? And it moves away from crops and towards cash, all right? So... That is, initially, the lords are paying tribute to the lords above them. They're actually delivering crops to them. So what, what changes is the, the, the higher-up lords and kings begin to say, you know what, don't give me the crop. Sell the crop. Give me the money. Right? So we, we transition from a, a payment-in-the-form-of-crop system to a cash system. And by the way, the same thing happens to the corvée, okay? The, the corvée system that I mentioned before, right, which is the, the serfs essentially, you know, they, they pay for access to the land through their labor, right, by, by agreeing to work uh, on that, that domain a certain number of days of the week. But the corvée system uh, it gets transformed and in, into cash rent, Okay, 
And by the way, that system is still with us in some form. Okay, we don't have lords and serfs anymore, right? But we still have this term, right? We still have the landlord, right? The landlord is the one who owns the land to whom you pay typically a cash rent, right? So the basis of the rent system comes out of the system of lords and serfs. It's, a, it's an anachronistic holdover from a much earlier uh, time period, right, in, in European history. Okay, so the, the, there's this transformation occurs, and where are you going to get cash from, right? Where, the, where do the, the, the crops have to be sold, right? We, we are moving away from subsistence agriculture, okay, growing crops to eat them, and now we're growing, going towards cash crops, right? The point of growing the crop is to sell it and gain money, okay? What happens along the way, you know, it, whenever there's more selling, the markets rise, right? Markets grow, okay? There's more buying and more selling, right? Markets grow, and what, what happens in markets, right? Markets contain prices, okay? So as markets grow in prominence, there is more and more market activity. You know, markets go from being something that you might do once a season, right? Um, because, you know, markets themselves are very, very old, right? Markets are much older than feudalism. Uh, markets have a very, very long history. They're much older than capitalism. It's just that they they grow in terms of the, the amount, the volume of transactions, the number of times you might interact with a market, right? You go from okay, well, he, now it's the harvest, we're going to bring that to market. That only happens maybe a few times a year, right? So you go from interacting with markets a few times a, a year to much more frequently, right? Um, markets grow, the volume of trade grows, okay? Now we also have, you know, we talk about 500 years ago, we have the development of colonialism, right? This, this war, between, this competition between lords in Europe takes on now an international dimension, right? We have we have the the discovery of the Americas. Uh, well, obviously the people living in the Americas already knew about it, but the, the discovery by Europe, right? The, so you have the discovery of the Americas followed by the conquest and colonization of that region, followed by the conquest and colonization of many other regions during this period, okay? So there's a lot more competition and that competition is not just against your neighboring lord, it's against other countries, right? Other kings who want to control territory much further afield, right? Uh, much further afield in the world, okay? You have the revival of the slave trade, right? So for the first time, you have a truly international or truly global slave trade uh, that uh, takes place between, you know, this is the triangular trade, right? Learned about this in, in history class, right? This is the, the trade between uh, Europe, Africa, and the New World. Okay, so okay, Europe, Africa, and the Americas. Okay, the Americas, and a lot of it uh, is in, in the Caribbean. Okay, so... And this is a trade which is designed to benefit uh, the colonial powers in Europe, right? So, okay, all, all of this, all of these changes also cause internal stresses to appear in the feudal order itself, all right? So these stresses initially take the form of, okay, so feudalism always had a kind of a pressure valve, right? Like not everyone is going to be happy uh, not everyone's going to accept uh, their station in life, right? Like I said, this system is designed that if you're a serf, you're going to be a serf forever. You're going to die a serf, right? That you, if you're a carpenter, that's your trade. You're going to be that forever, right? So there's a one little pressure valve, which is that maybe if you're really good at fighting, you can get knighted, right? But there's another pressure valve, okay? That is serfs. There is a tradition, uh, you know, in many parts of Europe, there's a tradition that says serfs uh, can can run away from their farms, right? They 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 can run away from the medieval uh, manor uh, and and go to the cities, okay? 
So serfs uh, can they can leave their uh, their their tenure right their their serfdom they can leave their vassalage, but if they do so, they are actually breaking their oath, you know, and being an oath breaker, very, very serious uh, thing, you know, that's a very serious violation. So they leave, they're breaking their oath, uh, and, you know, the, the Lord could, if they want, um, can make them return. Right? It can actually drag you back. Say no, you are you're gonna stay, right? You you swore an oath. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to it, okay? But the tradition is, look, if you can stay away for one year, then that that relationship is severed, okay? And you can't return, uh, you can't be forced to return, but you also have no place either, right? Like, you know, the the serfs. The reason it's called tenure, right? This is a word. It still exists in our society, right, in a vestigial form, right? Usually only referring to, to people like me, right, to, to professors. Professors have tenure. But, you know, it used to be used in a much broader sense, meaning that is your place, right? You, you have, you can always return to, you always have access to, to this land, right? Uh, so if you, if you leave and stay away for a year, you lose that, right? But more and more serfs begin to do this, okay? Because, again, the tension and strain of this, the need for uh, lords to protect themselves from other lords that are trying to gather power, right? What happens is that the corvée system goes through more and more strain, right? Like I said, it gets transformed into the cash rent system, but these rents begin to rise, right? That places more and more pressure on the serfs, the serfs have to work harder and harder in order to to uh, be able to deliver to the lords enough in terms of rent, right? A struggle that we are still familiar with today, right? Uh, your rent goes up, you have to work harder. That's, that's also true in the modern time, right? So many serfs, especially young ones, begin to leave the feudal manor, okay? And they go to the cities. Right, serfs flee and they go to the cities because the cities are centers of something new that's happening right there's they're centers of you know trade right trade gives rise to a lot of new jobs okay so the the port cities the places where there's a lot of trade uh, go through a tremendous amount of growth okay so and People become aware of this, right? They start to see, well, there's a different way of life that's occurring in the cities, uh, and it's it's maybe better, you know? I mean, you don't know. You're taking a risk, right? But So all of this places additional strain, right? If you have fewer serfs, well, in order, and, and you have more demands on the crops and the cash that they are giving you, well, then you're going to need to raise rent further, right? So... You see the difficulty, right, that the, the, the feudal system goes under more and more strain, okay? We, we begin to have political strain on it as well, right? That is, the, the lords, you know, initially it's like what the king says goes, right? But the, the lords say, no, we want more of a say in terms of how the politics is going to be, is going to be or, organized, right? The lords want to vote, the lords want to vote. And, uh, why not, right? Uh, they they don't want to just do whatever the king says, right? I mean, the king is a noble kind of like them, right? Like maybe a little bit, uh, supposed to be a little bit higher, but they're like, well, we're nobles too. We want to be able to vote. And then the desire to vote becomes much more widespread, right? You know, the 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 it's it's not just the lords that would like a vote. It's also the blacksmiths and the carpenters and the you know, the merchants, because the merchants don't fit into this system very well, right? The merchants are commoners. But you know what happens with all this trade, right, and all this growth of markets? Is that merchants start to become very rich, right? The, the, the more markets there are, the more people who specialize just in buying and selling do well, right? So lords want to vote, and pretty soon everyone wants to vote, right? <laughs> 
Everyone wants to vote. So everyone demands that they now get a vote. Um, now that's a new thing, right? And we start to see new laws and constitutions and whatever, right? The England develops the, they, um, you know, they have two different legislative bodies, right? They have the, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And this, this kind of deals with this split, right? Which is that initially it's only the Lords that get a vote, but it, this process continues until we get a very different politics in the society, right? We go from the Lords just running everything to people voting. Now that's a, that, that happens through revolutions, right? One of the first revolutions that occurs is in France, okay? The French, the French Revolution. And the French Revolution is partly, it is a revolution against this old system, okay? The, the French say, look, if you're a lord, if you're one of these, these uh, people who thinks you're better, who is an exploiter, we, we have developed a special machine for you. It's called the guillotine, all right? Here's how it works, okay? It's got a little, it's got a nice little wooden rest here, and it has a frame up here. And it has a big, heavy sliding blade, okay? Big, heavy sliding blade. And you put your head right here, just rest it right there, real comfortable. And then this blade comes down and chops your head off, right? Believe it or not, this guillotine uh, was designed to be humane. I know it doesn't exactly have that reputation, right, of being humane, but... You know, it, it, because it, it always cuts your head off in one stroke, right? Which is sometimes doesn't occur if you do that by hand, you know? Um, turns out it's, I mean, I've never actually done this myself, so I can't really say, but it turns out cutting someone's head off with a sword can go wrong. You know, you can, all right, anyway, let's not, we don't need more detail on that. The point is the French Revolution is a revolution against the feudal system, okay? To saying, you know, we don't like this system anymore. We want something new, okay? We want to overturn system. Okay, so here is the problem that economic theory attempts to solve, right? The old system, okay, the old system of feudalism, you know, it might have been unequal and it might have been unfair and whatever, but it, it had been around for a long time and people understood it, you know? You, you could understand how it worked, you know? Uh, yeah, of course how it worked is that the serfs get screwed over by the lords, right? That's, that's how it works. But it at least makes sense, okay? The new system is much harder to understand, okay? So the new system, which actually doesn't even have a name for a long time, right? It, it only has a name once that this change has already occurred, right? Because that's how history is. History, you know, we look back on things and we're able to see how they've changed. When you're in the midst of it, you often can't see it, okay? So this new system, capitalism, is very confusing, Okay, because markets are the basis, right? So markets, when markets become the basis of, of society, much more so than they were before, you have the rise of prices. But here's the thing about prices, right? Prices change. And these, these price changes can have a huge impact on you, right? So imagine this, right? Imagine that you're a farmer and you're bringing crops to the market, okay? But let's say that this happens, right? Let's say that the price for your crop, whatever it is, falls by 10%, okay? Now, the nature of farming is, you know, you, the nature of farming is that you, you grow and then you harvest, okay? So you have a, you, you produce, you don't produce the crop evenly, right? You, you have, one, two, maybe three harvests, and it depends on the climate and what you're growing or whatever, but you have at most a few uh, um, harvests per year. So if the prices change by 10% during the time that you happen to harvest, that is going to have a huge impact on your income, right? Now, prices in markets, they change, right? That's just, that's one of the things that we observe about markets, right? And the more activity in markets, typically the more prices change. So one of the things that economics sought to explain was why do prices change? Okay, so this is like the, the new economic theories that arose uh, that tried to explain 
why prices change, right? And their, their explanation involved uh, a theory of value. Okay, so what makes things have value? Why, are, why is the value high for some things and low for other things? And then what is price and why do prices change? Okay, so this is one of the things that economic theory try to explain, okay? The movement and the, the dynamic change that's occurring in markets, okay? Other things that economic theory tried to explain was, well, what is this new thing happening, right? We have industrialization. We have the factory system. How does this work? Uh, can we have a society, right? There's so much change that's occurring here, all right? We wanna know, is it is it is it society just kind of falling apart? Is it possible that we could actually have stability even in the in the midst of all this change? Okay, so it, there's a lot of change, but what is stable? How do we explain? Like, do markets ever provide stability? We know that prices change a lot. Why do prices change? And then why are they sometimes stable? Is a related question. Okay, so we, we want this notion of stability, which becomes described later in economic thought as the notion of equilibrium, okay? Equilibrium means stability, all right? So when a lot of things are changing in society, as they are during this period, you can see that trying to explain why things might stop changing, it becomes a very compelling uh, idea, right? So the point is, Economic theories arise to try to make sense of all of this stuff that's happening, okay? And they, it arises at a particular moment in history, okay? So it's not that people didn't have things to say about economics before about 300 years ago. They did. It's just that economics as a separate discipline, uh, it's relatively new, right? Because it comes out of this transition from feudalism to capitalism, whereas other branches of thought you know, things like philosophy or mathematics are much, much older. Uh, they have, you know, different roots. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about in my le next lecture is what are the details of some of these economic theories and how, do they, how, how are they similar and how are they different? Because what we find is we end up with different economic theories that emerge, right? Which only makes sense because, again, when we're dealing with a system of complexity, okay, which is all, all of the stuff that I'm talking about, right? There's a lot of variables. They're all interwoven. These are features of complexity, right? When we're dealing with complexity, we have at best only a partial view of the situation, right? Now, if we're going to have a partial view of the situation, we're, we're probably going to emphasize different things, right? Like you, you might see it differently than I do, okay? So and, and none of us has a, uh, the whole picture, right? It's a little bit like that story of, you know, the, the, the five blind men and they are trying to understand the elephant, right? Each one touches only a part of the elephant, right? One touches the tail and thinks the elephant is, you know, very long and thin, right? One touches the leg and one touches the trunk. And, you know, they, because they all have a partial view, they have a very different understanding of the elephant, right? They, none of them can see the whole thing. So that's the situation with economic theory and this new system, capitalism. Nobody has a complete picture of it. It's not really possible to get a complete picture of it. There's so much of it that we can't observe. There's so many variables and relationships. Again, it's the problem of complexity, okay? So what we end up with is different economic theories. And these different economic theories, are they, they influence the world in different ways, right? They have an influence. So that's what we're going to talk about and describe in the next lecture. All right. Thank you very much.